In 2017, Analog released the NT Mini, a premium console designed to play 8-bit NES games with exceptional accuracy and video quality. But at $450, it was prohibitively expensive for most. Now, just one year later, the next generation of FPGA console gaming has arrived, and this time, it's affordable. This is the Super NT. Boasting high accuracy playback, pristine video output, and loads of features, the Super NT packs a lot of power into a small form factor, all at a reasonable price. But with so many options available for playing Super NES games, you might be wondering what exactly makes this product special, and how does it stack up against the competition? On this hardware edition of DF Retro, we're returning once again to the Super NES for an exploration of the new Super NT. We'll check out its feature set, put it to the test and weigh in on its overall quality. For this video, Analog provided us with two units to put through its paces, and hopefully by the end of this video, you'll agree that we've done just that. So, dig out your cartridges because it's time to start playing with Super Power. The Super NES is often heralded as Nintendo's greatest console, and it's difficult to disagree. With its vast selection of genre-defining games and gorgeous pixel art capabilities, the Super NES helped shape gaming as we know today. Despite its age, the success of Nintendo's own SNES Mini suggests that a lot of people are still very much interested in experiencing Super NES. But what if you want to play your original cartridges on your brand new 4K TV? Enter the Super NT, Analog's latest take on classic hardware. The Super NT is an FPGA-based console designed to play Super NES and Super Famicom games from any region with a focus on accuracy and low latency. At $189 US dollars, it also sells for half the cost of the Analog NT Mini. Despite the lower price point, the Super NT exudes quality both inside and out. With its weighted base, the system feels hefty despite its small size. It also ships in four different variations, including a transparent version and a Super Famicom style design. One of the key elements in bringing down the cost of the system then stems from its materials. The anodized aluminum shell featured in the NT and NT Mini is gorgeous, but it's also expensive to produce. With the Super NT, Analog opted instead for plastic in line with most other game consoles. The difference here stems from the fit, finish, and thickness of the plastic, which is roughly a millimeter or so thicker than a real Super Famicom and feels sturdier as a result. Another cost-saving measure comes in the form of available outputs. The NT Mini features both HDMI and analog video out, while the Super NT reduces this to just a single HDMI output. Analog video was a major selling point with the NT Mini since NES consoles don't natively support RGB out. But with the Super NES, RGB is supported out of the box, making this feature feel less critical. Of course, for CRT purists, Analog has confirmed that a digital-to-analog converter is in development for the system that will allow analog output from the Super NT, if you desire. Power is now supplied via a micro-USB connector, which allows the system to operate via any USB port which can supply the necessary 5 volts, 2 amps, making it far more convenient to move around. Overall then, the Super NT is a beautiful, well-crafted system that feels premium and sturdy despite the switch to a plastic shell. But this is only part of the package. It's what's inside the box that truly defines this console. In 
in creating the Super NT like the NT Mini before it, Analog contracted out the engineering excellence of Kevin Kevtris Horton to develop the internal components. Late last year, I joined friends of the show, Corey and Mark from My Life in Gaming, on a road trip to visit Kevin and discuss his work on the Super NT. It was an enlightening experience, to say the least. Compared to the NT Mini before it, the Super NT uses a larger variant of the Altera Cyclone 5 FPGA with additional RAM chips on board. Field programmable gate arrays have received a lot of buzz lately after the NT Mini and Retro AVS were released, and for good reason. It's a solution that attempts to recreate hardware functions on an electrical level in small form factor with a low power draw. It reads game carts over a live cartridge bus. It reads controller inputs the same way as the original hardware, generates its video entirely in real time, and is free of any additional overhead or leg, but it's ultimately still programmed much like an emulator. You see, the Super NT's core is written using a hardware description language known as Verilog. This language essentially allows the developers to define digital circuits in a textual manner. The result is a design which can execute instructions in parallel like the Super Nintendo's original integrated circuits, but its accuracy ultimately hinges on the quality of the code. FPGAs are not inherently a miracle solution, but in the right hands, the results are impressive. The key advantage in using an FPGA then lies in its latency, or lack thereof. With no additional overhead, the Super NT can precisely reproduce the behavior of the original Super Nintendo hardware with absolute cycle accuracy. That's not to say cycle accuracy isn't possible in software, mind you. Software emulation written for a modern CPU generally works by processing in batches. You can process many cycles at a time, but not necessarily exactly as it occurs on original hardware. The hardware requirements are dramatically higher compared to an FPGA solution then. The reason the Super NT works so well as a product lies with its marriage of this high accuracy FPGA core to an excellent user experience. With its polished front end menu, sleek design, and low power draw, it really is a pleasure to use. Now it's time for the showdown. Later in the video, we'll walk through some of the system's menu options and make sense of what's available, but before that, I want to put the Super NT through a series of tests while drawing comparisons with other popular options for enjoying Super NES games. After all, there are many ways to play the Super NES today. The first option is to simply use an original Super Nintendo control deck connected to a CRT television, but not everyone has the desire or room to house such a monitor. A more expensive solution is to pick up a device like the open source scan converter or the frame meister to display the original console properly on your flat panel TV. Of course, when you factor in the cost of those devices with the cables and the original console itself, well, it does cost more than the Super NT. We'll be using an OSSC paired with a one chip Super NES with a brightness attenuation mod for conducting our tests. Another option is, of course, emulation. In its current state, Super NES emulation is in a remarkable place. The best solution available in terms of accuracy is Higan, an emulator which offers precision on par with the Super NT itself. The last option we'll be looking at here today is the Super NES Mini, Nintendo's own emulator in a box solution. It's a great little device, but it's also very focused on playing just a small handful of games. We'll be testing games that aren't officially supported today, but keep in mind that this is for demonstration purposes only. There are plenty of other emulators available, of course, along with clone consoles, though I wouldn't recommend most of them due to inaccuracies or the misuse of open source emulation code. In that sense, this is one area where I feel analog should be commended. The Super NT is the product of finding and hiring the right people to develop a great product. This is not a Retron 5 situation, that's for sure. Within our limited scope then, it's time to run some comparisons. Now, in terms of playing typical Super NES games, it's difficult to find fault with any of these solutions, really. I tested random games on the consoles and let the attract modes play out and everything played just as they're designed to do. Contra 3 is exactly as you would expect, with no visible glitching or artifacts, and the same is true of Tiny Toon Adventures Buster Bust Loose, a great platforming game by Konami that also looks and runs exactly as it should. Even something more obscure like this little graphical glitch that appears in Earthworm Jim 2 just before the stage fades in behaves exactly the same on the Super NT as it does on a real console. 
Speaking of Earthworm Jim 2, this title relies heavily on streaming digital audio samples, and poor emulation can ruin the game's sound. On real hardware, it sounds like this. Load it up on the Super NT and you get this. Yep, exactly the same. And the same is true of Hegon as well. But using the default SNES Mini emulator produces these results instead. We can't complain though, since this isn't an included game with the package by default, but it is interesting to see what can go wrong here. Okay then, how about an official game, Yoshi's Island? When using the SNES Mini, there's a bug in the level Touch Fuzzy, Get Dizzy, which causes the background to momentarily disappear when you hit an enemy. This of course does not occur on real hardware. And the Super NT? No problem at all. In fact, the same is true of Hegon as well. Both play Yoshi's Island perfectly. Keep in mind that the Super NT does not need to emulate the special chips included in cartridges, as they are run directly from the cartridges through the live bus. The Super NT interacts with these add-on chips just like a real Super NES. So how about a more troublesome game then? Airstrike Patrol has become notoriously difficult to emulate for a multitude of reasons. Firstly, the entire menu system is rendered in a high resolution, certainly higher than most SNES games, and it switches between different resolutions as you move from screen to screen. It's seamless on a CRT, but you'll get momentary dropouts on the Framemeister or the OSSC as it changes resolution. Then there's the shadow feature. Yes, the shadow visible below your plane is the product of a developer trick involving manipulating the picture processing unit mid-scanline. Nearly every available software emulator that I've tested fails to display this properly, but this is how it should look on real hardware. So how does the Super NT fare? Well, as you can see, it works just fine. The shadow is visible beneath your plane, but the way it's drawn does, at least to the eye, appear slightly differently than both off-screen and OSSC captured footage. The shadow also displays in Hegon and looks a lot like the Super NT, though the specific visible shadow lines do seem to vary between the two. It is a rather strange technique though, so it's a little difficult to judge. And the SNES Mini, of course, fails this completely with no visible shadow. In fact, even the mission start text is broken on the Mini. And the menu system? Well, this high resolution menu system is an interesting beast indeed, but you can forget about it working on the SNES Mini. It does not at all, and it looks completely broken. The Super NT and Hegan, however, both display the menu just fine, but with visible combing artifacts during motion. You see, the SNES is outputting an interlaced high resolution image here, and both solutions take this into account, but do not appear to actually de-interlace the output. Not a big deal for static menus, mind you, but there is at least one game which uses the high-res mode during gameplay. RPM Racing. This isometric racing game was developed by Silicon and Synapse, who you might know today as Blizzard. This is what you should see when playing on a CRT monitor. And this is what you get when using an upscaler like the Framemeister. So what happens on the Super NT? Visible combing artifacts across the image. And we see the same thing on Hegan as well. The SNES Mini of course fails this test once again due to its inability to display this resolution properly. The handling of high resolution graphics is certainly interesting however, when discussing this, Kevin explained that it would be possible to implement a mode which updates the screen twice as fast while incrementing the line, essentially line doubling the image into a progressive output. Probably not worth it though, just for this one game. But here's the thing, some games arbitrarily turn on interlaced output even when displaying low res content. Kevin implemented a feature in the menu to display this mode in proper low resolution. It just so happens that Artemio's excellent 240p test suite is perfect for testing this out, with a Sonic the Hedgehog background no less. Without this feature in Gage, this is what you'll see in the Super NT, visible combing artifacts throughout the image, which are also visible in Hegun. Enabling the interlace disable feature then solves this entirely, producing a crystal clear image instead. 
This won't solve the issue with RPM Racing's higher resolution mode, but it does remove artifacts visible when low res games use interlacing. Thus far then, the Super NT has played each game without additional bugs, but that doesn't mean they aren't possible. After searching high and low, I did manage to find one very subtle bug in a game known as Megalomania. On a real Super Famicom, the intro text crawl features the image of a sword and shield in the background, which eventually scales itself out of the scene. On the Super NT, however, I noticed a small single pixel height line visible here at this edge. And those missing pixels are visible along the top portion of the image. Once the text disappears, however, the shield is restored. So what about Higan then? Well, the same glitch occurs, only the visible line appears greater in length. This is a very minor thing, of course, but it does highlight how difficult the quest for accuracy can truly be. Developers of this era often use tricks that almost seem off-spec or introduce bugs into their code, yet they somehow work. Which calls to mind one of the most notorious emulation bugs, the Speedy Gonzales button. When people first emulated this game, it was impossible to finish. When you reach level 6-1, you must jump on this button for the game to progress. But on these emulators, it would just crash. So I played through the entire game on the Super NT just to answer the question for you. Does it crash? The answer? No, it does not. The correct value is red and the game continues just as it does on real hardware, allowing us to finish this somewhat frustrating game. The issue is related to a loop which is triggered while waiting for a specific value to be returned where incorrect bus behavior of the emulator would ensure this value would never actually be returned. And as far as I'm aware, Higan is the only emulator which handles this properly. I didn't have the patience to try this again on the SNES Mini, but odds are high that it would crash. I can't really say for sure though. What I do know is that the Super NT and Higan both passed this test with flying colors. But here's the thing, that megalomania glitch shown earlier might make you wonder about what happens if you do find a glitch. Mortal Kombat 2 was broken on one of the earlier firmwares for instance, but it was reported and fixed in short order. As of firmware 3.9, it runs perfectly. One of Analog's own tweets showcased a loop of R-Type 3 with a visual glitch embedded in the GIF. A lot of folks were worried about this and asked me to test it, and I did. But even on the older firmware, it works perfectly, no glitches at all. Mark from My Life in Gaming encountered a small visual glitch in Stunt Race FX where garbage would appear along the top and bottom of the screen, but again, it was fixed rapidly. The point is, no system like this is going to be 100% perfect out of the gate, but the Super NT gets shockingly close, and when problems do crop up, Analog and Keftra seem to be taking care of it very quickly. These are minor things in the grand scheme of things, so it's great to see so much care being poured into this product after manufacturing. So what's the conclusion to these tests then? While well, both the Super NT and Higon managed to almost perfectly replicate the experience of a real Super NES. The SNES Mini falls well short when playing unsupported games of course, but this is something that applies to other software emulators as well. Sticking with Z-SNES or a Raspberry Pi just isn't going to cut it if you value absolute accuracy. And this accuracy is a key ingredient to the Super NT, a major selling point. But really, it's the overall user experience that elevates this system to the top. The controller-driven interface, ability to use your carts and original controllers, and a lack of additional latency make for an excellent way to play Super NES games. While I'm a CRT purist at heart, I firmly believe that the Super NT is the single best way to play Super NES carts on a flat panel TV. It's also loaded with options. When you first fire up the Super NT, you'll be presented with a nice randomized boot up sequence, followed by a menu. Jumping into the options, the number of available adjustments can appear overwhelming at first. So here's a few tips on setting up the Super NT for optimal playback. Let's start with the video options. The Super NT supports 480, 720, and 1080p at both 50 and 60 Hz. I asked Kevin about 4K support and was told that no chips support this just yet. It's just too many pixels per second. 
With the available options, I find that 1080p provides the sharpest image when going for that raw pixel look, but 720p is beneficial if you want to use scan lines since it produces a look closer to that of a CRT. Speaking of scan lines, you can disable them and select between two options, normal and hybrid. Normal paints solid lines through the image with an adjustable depth slider which determines thickness. Hybrid scan lines, however, are the result of a collaboration with Marshall, the creator of Ultra HDMI for N64, and this allows for varying degrees of thickness based on the brightness of the surrounding colors. Another important option in this menu is Gamma Boost. This helps make up for the brightness lost when using scan lines, but it's useful even when not using them. You see, some deeper shades are difficult to see even without scan lines, but Gamma Boost clears that right up, and I recommend leaving it enabled for all modes. Then there's image size. By default, you can select between these options. The labels for 1 to 1 and 8 by 7 are kind of misleading though, with 1 to 1 offering a square image rather than integer scale square pixels, and 8 by 7 not quite delivering perfectly square pixels but enabling the advanced mode allows us to manually adjust scaling values. This is made possible by the addition of a frame buffer. The Super NT essentially features its own very customizable scalar chip designed to match or exceed what can be achieved with an expensive XRGB frame meister. This includes the option to enable horizontal and vertical interpolation to clean up sparkling edges when using a non-integer scale. I've been using these settings thanks to Mark's suggestion, and they provide a nice 4x3 image that fills the screen. If you prefer to disable interpolation and go for an integer scale, you'll want to multiply your values by height and width, which is 240 and 256 respectively. There's also several scaling options and the ability to crop the image, something useful for NES games which often showed garbage in the overscan region, but not so much with the Super NES. Under the extra features, it's possible to force more sprite tiles per line to avoid flicker, which is kind of rare on the SNES, but still a nice feature to have. This is where you'll find the interlace disable function, which we covered earlier as well. The pseudo high-res blending mode, though, is useful in games like Kirby 3, where the higher resolution mode is used for certain layers to simulate transparency. On a CRT, the effect looks like this, and it's pretty neat in action, I think. When played on a Super NT, however, you can see that it's just alternating between solid and blank pixels using the double width mode. Enable high res blending then, and suddenly it looks like a real transparent layer. Beautiful. Another important feature made possible by the frame buffer are the buffer modes. By default, the system runs using the zero delay mode. Normally, the Super NES runs at roughly 60.09 Hz but zero delay reduces the system speed to a solid 60 hertz instead, the reason to match up with the modern flat panel refresh rates available. Using this option, games run without any additional input latency and never exhibit skipped or torn frames. Game speed is ever so slightly slower, but it's difficult to tell when actually playing the games, and this is my preferred option. If you want to match the original speed of the system, however, fully buffered and single buffer are available. Fully buffered operates with additional latency, ranging from 0 to 16 milliseconds that then wraps around, according to Kevtris. The idea here is to drop a frame every 10 seconds or so, but in its current iteration, several frames of tearing appear along the topmost line of that interval instead, which is kind of a preferable way to handle it, as it's much less distracting than a skipped frame. Single buffer reduces lag further at the expense of more noticeable screen tearing that appears once again every 10 seconds or so, as you can see here. It's an interesting option, but ultimately the least usable, as screen tearing is highly distracting. Oh, and one quick thing to note here. When interlacing is enabled in the extras menu, you'll want to use the single buffer option. This allows for a full 60 frames per second to be displayed despite the combing artifacts. If you use fully buffered or zero lag instead, however, the screen appears to update at half rate, or 30 frames per second. Perhaps half of the 60 fields are simply being discarded in these modes. You might be wondering how Hegon handles this then. Well, like the Super NT, Hegon strives to match the original speed of the Super NES. By default, this means screen tearing, unless you have a variable refresh rate display, I'd imagine. Screen tearing is a byproduct of the game running slightly faster than the refresh rate of your monitor. 
Now, if you prefer smooth scrolling, there is an option for this. I've found that the D3D exclusive full screen mode provides a completely smooth experience with zero skips, as long as you enable vertical sync, just like the zero delay mode on the Super NT. Unfortunately, this seems to influence sound playback causing intermittent skips. It's a very subtle thing, but it's there if you listen. Of course, keep in mind that this is just my experience. I've tried tweaking the different settings available, and when using exclusive full screen mode, this is what I get every time. And that's the only way I was able to get completely smooth scrolling. I should mention that Heegan does have steep requirements, and I'm running this on an Intel i9-7900X CPU. On a 60Hz display then, I feel that the Super NT solution for solving this issue just works a little better overall. Okay, so let's move into the sound menu. This is a very simple menu with just a few options, and the only option you'll really need to adjust, I believe, is the cartridge audio enable feature. So what does it do? Well, if you're using a Super Game Boy or the MSU-1 equipped SD2 SNES, it feeds analog audio through the cartridge port to the Super NT. That's right, the Super Game Boy does indeed work with the Super NT and it's an interesting case. After all, real Game Boy hardware is built directly into the cart and it interfaces with your Super NT just like a Super NES. It even works with the Super Game Boy specific borders. At 60Hz though, the system does drop more frames since the Game Boy uses a different refresh rate than a Super NES. Of course, even the SNES drops frames due to this refresh rate mismatch. However, since Game Boy games only fill a portion of the screen, you can use the fully buffered mode to reduce the possible skips without issue since tear lines only appear along the top portion of the image and are not visible within the smaller Game Boy image. The rest of the options available on the system involve tweaking the menu, colors, and general operation to your liking, and it's all pretty easy to understand. Good stuff all around. Oh, and my favorite combination of colors and settings? I like to use the purple highlights with the throb feature and the default font with the uppercase option disabled. Overall, the user experience is an integral part of the hardware and a huge part of what makes it a good experience for the user. The overall impression of the Super NT then is overwhelmingly positive. The years of experience and work by the talented individuals that contributed to this product shine through. This is the best possible console you can buy for playing Super NES games on a modern flat panel TV. It's accurate, it's well built, it's beautiful, and it's easy to use. After spending weeks with the device and testing loads of games, I only ever managed to locate those few minor errors mentioned earlier in this video. The level of accuracy on here is certainly impressive. The only remaining question for me then is where they go from here. Kevtris did release unofficial cores for the NT Mini after all, enabling other 8-bit systems, but it has not been confirmed that the same thing will happen here. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. One last cool feature that I simply have to mention is the inclusion of two extra games, Super Turrican the Director's Cut and Turrican 2. The Director's Cut is the complete version of Super Turrican, which was previously unreleased. The story is that the game was created with a 6 megabit ROM in mind, but budget cuts forced the team to cut this down to fit in 4 megabits instead, thus limiting the content. The version included here restores that missing content. Super Turrican 2 then is also included and is one of the more technically impressive games I've played in the Super NES. There's a lot of cool effects and scaling put to use throughout the game and it just looks awesome in motion. Perhaps someday in the future I can dedicate a full episode of DF Retro to the legendary Turrican series. And with that we've come to the end of our video. Hopefully you've enjoyed this look at the Super NT, and if you did enjoy it be sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on Twitter. And until next time, stay retro.